Your Excellency, Madam First Lady of Botswana, Mrs. Neo Jane Masisi, Your Excellencies, Honorable Minister Nyeleki Brook Mondlane, SADAC Current Chair and Honorable Minister Dr. Patricia Ani Kaliati, Incoming Chair of SADAC Malawi, Your Excellency, Dr. Veronique Mewanu Tognifode, Minister of Social Affairs and Microfinance of Benin, and Chair of the African Union Specialized Technical Committee on Gender Equality, Honorable Members of Parliament in our midst, international organizations, in, intergovernmental organizations, and regional body representatives, in particular the SADAC Secretariat, which is hosting us, representatives of the youth, civil society organizations, distinguished participants, uh, 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 colleagues, good morning. It is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce Her Highness, Her, Her, Her Excellency Mrs. Neo Jen Masisi, First Lady of Botswana, who will formally open our session this morning. Her Excellency Mrs. Neo Mas uh, Jen Masisi, an accountant by profession, has worked for leading organizations within the pu public and private sector in Botswana, and has also uh, worked in international orga organizations. She served in the United okay. Nations uh, for 14 years in three countries, and Her Excellency is committed to issues involving children, youth, and women empowerment. During 2019, Mrs. Masisi was appointed UNAID Special Ambassador for the empowerment and engagement of young people in Botswana. And at the top of her priority list has been addressing HIV AIDS amongst adolescents and young people. And she has an initiative she'll be speaking to us about, which is a countrywide initiative and campaign called the Parliament Seat. And uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Masisi, is also a member of the Organization of African Ladies for Development, OAFLAD, and these are just but a few of her remarkable contribution. And uh, we, be, without um, further ado, Your Excellency, the floor is yours to uh, give us the opening remarks of this session. Thank you very much, Jackie. Honorable Minister Nyeleki Brook Mondlane, the SADC current chair, and Honorable Minister Dr. Patricia Kalietti, the SADC incoming chair, Her Excellency Dr. Veronique Togni Ford, Minister of Social Affairs and Microfinance in Benin, and being president of the Technical Committee on Gender Equality of the AU. Members of the diplomatic corps here present and members, reps from international organizations, our esteemed panelists and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very good morning when I greet you from Botswana. I feel greatly honored and privileged as the guest of honor at this high level side event taking place on the sidelines of CSW 65. As you've titled it, now more than ever, tackling gender equality to end AIDS. This side event provides an opportunity for us to take stock of progress that the global community, including the SADC region, has made in addressing HIV AIDS and gender equality commitments under resolution CSW 62 on women, the girl child and HIV. We must acknowledge that despite global action on HIV AIDS for the past three decades, the disease burden has affected more women than men, mostly younger girls by the day. It is therefore important to note the global community found that the social norms, traditions and culture were major factors that led to such disparities in the HIV infection rates. Agenda 2030 clearly calls on the global community to leave no one behind in the race to end HIV AIDS by 2030 and fast track the elimination of the burden of diseases among young women and adolescent girls. Ladies and gentlemen, the CSW Resolution 62 is a clarion call that supports commitments of the 2030 development agenda by specifically challenging the global community to deal with social barriers, norms, and traditions 
which trigger vulnerability of women and girls to HIV and AIDS. It is not surprising that SADC has always been at the forefront in the implementation of this resolution. The prevalence of HIV AIDS in our region commands that we take a leading role in all global efforts against the pandemic. Of significance, resolution 62 emphasizes the importance of among others, girls education, intensify implementation of laws against gender-based violence, promote age-appropriate sexuality education, as well as encourage the involvement of all in addressing HIV and AIDS. These priorities, if effectively implemented, can potentially enable our region to significantly reduce and eventually remove gender inequalities that increase women's and girls' susceptibility to HIV AIDS. It is necessary to note that the resolution does not underestimate the contribution of key behavioral factors, such as multiple partners, sexual exploitation, and child marriage to the increased level of HIV among our people. Rather, the resolution was an eye opener in exposing the negative impact of norms, culture, and traditions that have subjected women and girls to abuse and undermined their socioeconomic independence. As it has been observed, the lack of freedom domestic violence and fear of violence has limited the ability of women and girls to take control of their sexual and reproductive lives, therefore rendering many of them defenseless in the face of HIV AIDS epidemic. GBV, which is mainly tilted towards our young women, is one glaring aspect of our lives that has exposed the vulnerability of women in our societies. However, I'm pleased to note that the SADC region has demonstrated commitment to the CSW62 by adopting a program of action for implementing the priorities of the resolution and to end GBV. Many of our countries are individually making tremendous efforts to implement this plan of action and other global commitments related to gender equality and women empowerment. Despite these efforts, our cultural barriers, norms and traditions are still felt in both the public and private sector throughout our region. For instance, to this very day, after many decades of repeating the same call, we see women representation at high level and decision-making positions remain on the law side. Therefore, collectively as SADC and as individual member states, we must take those deliberate steps to improve representation of women by appointing those committed, hardworking, and deserving to positions of power where they'll be involved in shaping our national policies and strategies. We need to intensify awareness, raising on issues of gender equality at both community and national levels for all our people to embrace gender equality. Distinguished participants, when I assumed the role of First Lady of Botswana on the 1st of April, 2018, I tasked myself to work with adults and girls and young women. I was also appointed the UNAID Special Ambassador for the Empowerment and Engagement of Young People in Botswana, giving me an opportunity to traverse the country under the Dipalametse road shows. The expression Dipalametse is Setswana, for things have gone to the top or have gone on an ascent. This expression was aligned with the theme, the last sprint towards ending AIDS by 2030 in Botswana, targeting mainly AYP. I was widely exposed to issues that affect this group of people where I heard the genuine stories firsthand from different members of their communities in the red zones. In Botswana, adolescent girls and young women continue to suffer the worst consequences of the epidemic, accounting for 34% of all new infections in 2017. In the same year, 33.5% of new infections in the country occurred among young people aged between 15 to 24 years. I'm pleased to highlight that with different partners in the national response, we embarked on a campaign across the country to engage young people, their families, traditional leaders, and communities. We were confronted with young people's lived realities, the diverse and multidimensional vulnerabilities, along with the narratives of hope and resilience were heart-wrenching at times while at the same time fascinating. To this day, I still hear those voices. We need our parents and teachers to talk to us openly about changing our changing bodies and sexuality. We demand legislation 
that protects us from these predators, including access to friendly spaces, where we feel comfortable to report these predators. I needed money for toiletries from the older man. I could not leave him. He feeds my children. I suppose these are also familiar. I'm sharing this experience to reveal that face-to-face -face interactions with those affected by HIV AIDS, especially our young people, can create safe and comfortable spaces for them to discuss their issues in an open and honest manner. And as such, rekindle hope and provide invaluable real-time information. This can help us to make informed interventions that support individuals, households, and their communities. More importantly, they generate community and youth-inspired solutions, lending themselves to ownership and accountability if adopted. Let me emphasize that men and boys remain significant carriers or bearers of these norms, and therefore it is imperative that they are an integral part of the long-term solution. You can say nothing without men and the boys, and we would like to see them leading, being in the forefront, in that advocacy as protectors, as defenders, as preservers, and as promoters of the right values. I hope that through this important session, you'll learn lessons from each other and contribute to efforts that are geared towards eliminating social barriers, norms, and traditions that undermine efforts against HIV and AIDS. And please take advantage of these fora to come up with strategies that will be critical in mapping the way forward to turn the path of HIV AIDS in our region. Let us be reminded that we are experiencing yet another devastating global pandemic, COVID-19 of course, which continues to cost lives even just at this moment as we speak and has shattered the world economy. Let me however emphasize that we must ensure that our global fight against this pandemic does not derail our focus against HIV AIDS. We have achieved significant milestones which we should jealously guard. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank those in the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic as they sit right in the eye of the storm. I extend this appreciation to all those across the Southern region and the globe as well, who are playing a critical role in preserving the lives of others. Please be reminded to observe the health protocols that your countries have set and hashtag now more than ever tackling gender inequality to end AIDS. I thank you all for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And as usual, uh, we can really um, uh, tell the passion that you have in indeed um, ensuring that we end AIDS now more than, than ever. And uh, you are very, very right, Your Excellency. The time has never been as momentous as we are today. And as we know, um, this is the year where generation equality is being launched, which, which means we have 10 years to completely tackle gender inequalities and reach uh, planet 5050 uh, by 2030. This is again also the year that um, um, uh, the current theme of uh, CSW this year is about in ensuring full participation of women and indeed with full participation of women, including young women, we will be able to completely achieve um, a, a equality. And we, this is the decade of action um, uh, on, the, on the social development goals. And uh, so the time has never been more uh, a, 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 a ripe for us to engage in ending AIDS uh, now. Um, we were due to get our welcome remarks from Honorable Minister Nyeleki Brook Mondlani. I hear he's having um, technical problems. They will be uh, helping us um, 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 uh, to, to resolve this. But we are um, online, Madam Moderator. We're oh. now online. Oh, wonderful. You are most welcome. And um, 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 uh, Honorable Minister Nyeleki is the current SADAC chair. And as you know, SADAC has been championing this resolution from the uh, onset and continues 
to engage in having um, a momentous uh, attraction and attention to the resolution. We are very humbled and very grateful uh, that SADC is actually keeping this resolution alive. Every CSW SADC uh, ensures that there is a side event on this resolution because it says that gender equality is key in ensuring we end AIDS. So without taking too much of your time, Honorable Minister, you are more than welcome to give us your welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. I'd like to present the apologies of Mozambique. There were technical issues, but let us move forward. Thank you very much for your patience. Your Excellency, First Lady of the Republic of Botswana, Madam Neo Masisi, Honorable Minister, Dr. Patricia Annie Kaliati, incoming chair of SEDEC, Madam Jacqueline Utamuriza Inzasibira, Regional Policy Specialist of UN Women Southern Africa, Multi-Country Office. Esteemed panelists, Your Excellency Don, Dr. Veronique Tognifod, uh, Madam Louis, Louis Shigandu, Madam Rukia Maniko, Dr. Joseph Pizzo, Dr. Remy Shawa, Dr. Kokeka Nobuduka, Madam Catherine Nyambura, uh, members of civil society, ladies and gentlemen, may I convey warm greetings to all participants to this virtual meeting concerning the CSW 65 high level virtual side event on implementing the CSW resolution 60 stroke two on women, the girl child and HIV. As you know, had it not been for the challenges related to COVID-19, I would be welcoming you to the beautiful city of Maputo in Mozambique. The SADC Secretariat in partnership with Frontline AIDS and UN Women Southern Africa Multi-Country Office have successfully galvanized both the human and financial resources to make this CSW side event possible. Moreover, the, president, the presence of the First Lady of Botswana, Her Excellency, Madam Neo Masisi, Honorable Ministers and High Delegates signifies that we can look forward to a robust discussion that will fully address our experiences, successes and challenges pertaining to the issue of women, our girl children and HIV and AIDS. I hereby wish to indicate at the outset that one of the greatest challenges facing SADC member states as we move towards greater integration is the adverse effect of effects of HIV and AIDS on social, political and economic development. Our region has one of the highest levels of HIV prevalence globally. Hence, member states are currently grappling with severe impact of HIV and AIDS, which is intrinsically engendered. It is my hope that our discussions will provide a unique opportunity to ensure that young people are not left behind in the HIV response. I would also like to appeal to young people in this virtual forum today to participate actively in order to contribute to the discussion and propose a strong program of action that addresses the needs and rights of youth, as well as to identify opportunities for engagement and advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, empowering adolescent girls and young women to claim their rights, protect their sexual and reproductive health access services, and live free of gender-based violence and discrimination, especially during this scourge of COVID-19, is at the core of ending the AIDS epidemic. This side event, therefore, will discuss addressing the particular needs of adolescent girls and young women in ending the AIDS epidemic in our region. Ladies and gentlemen, I am in, indeed delighted that owing to the multifaceted and multidimensional nature of the SADC sponsored resolution 60.2 on women, the girl child and HIV and AIDS, we have been privileged to have a heterogeneous group of participants with multiple back backgrounds drawn from member states, representatives, development partners, civil society, and think tanks. Therefore, let us reflect in the awareness that the AIDS response is intrinsically 
linked to and dependent upon progress across a range of sustainable development goals, including poverty eradication, gender equality, education, justice, and inclusive institutions, as well as across targets within the global health goal. This side of the event, as we know, will discuss how to best leverage these synergies, as well as key lessons learned from the SADC member states AIDS response that can help to accelerate progress across the sustainable development goals. And in doing so, leveraging the end of AIDS for social transformation and sustainable development. So without further ado, to sum up, ladies and gentlemen, let us emphasize that the success of any blueprint depends upon engaged leadership. It is evident that the SADC 60.2 program of action is a key blueprint which requires commitment and transformative leadership across national and regional institutions in order to yield positive results. I would like to thank you very much and be assured that SADC is proud and greatly honored to have you all here and looking forward to successful deliberations. My apologies again, Madam President, uh, 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 First Lady, and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, uh, Minister Monzani, and uh, you are indeed um, uh, fully uh, forgiven this technology. I oftentimes uh, joke with uh, my younger colleagues that some of us were born before these computers were created. So they have to be patient with us and uh, uh, allow us to go at Hello, our Jove. own pace. <laughs> Yeah, so I, we are indeed uh, having a very um, uh, a, a presumptuous and uh, very uh, a, a, a great agenda of saying that we want to think and uh, reflect on how to end AIDS uh, now, now more than ever. But uh, the commitment and the resolutions are often not enough. So we need to know what are we going to do differently or how are we going to intensify what we are doing, which we know that is working in a more coherent and more coordinated manner for us to be able to indeed claim that we'll be able to end AIDS. And for that, I have a distinguished panel that will be giving us a different aspects of um, um, a strategies of how to do things better or how to do things differently. Of course, we'll not be able to finish um, 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 uh, everything in one hour and a half, but we believe this is a critical and strategic conversation which will ignite a more longer dialogue um, with all the parties in order to reach uh, the results. To start us in this conversation, I have um, uh, with us the person who I would say maybe have been a custodian of this resolution. And uh, it is uh, Dr. Joseph Pizzo, who is um, uh, the current senior program officer, gender and head of gender unit at the SADAC Secretariat. Whenever you hear this resolution, you hear Dr. Pizzo. He was here from when the resolution was adopted and was part of those who championed it and also ensured that it's translated in, into programmatic um, uh, interventions. And he is coordinating the efforts on this resolution within the SADAC Secretariat. And he was previously with the United Nations working with UNFPA in Botswana. And uh, he has many years of experience in promoting evidence-based policy making for social development, as well as providing technical support to strengthen programs and strategies that address gender-based violence, gender inequality, and HIV. So without taking too much of your time, uh, Dr. Pizzo, I would want us, uh, you to give us a brief background on the resolution and the progress to date, but most especially focusing on where you think we could fully utilize the opportunity of this resolution in addressing gender inequality in the HIV response. Over to you, Dr. Pizzo. Good 
Good morning. Um, I don't know if I'm appearing. Yes, we can see you well. Go ahead. Yeah, because on the screen I only see <laughs> see you. Anyway, uh, good morning. Let me um, acknowledge um, Her Excellency uh, Mrs. Neo Masisi, our First Lady here in Botswana, and uh, also Honourable uh, Ministers and uh, other uh, partners and colleagues who are here present. Um, please allow me to say all protocol observed. We have a uh, shorter time, but I would like to start off by um, conveying a warm greetings from the Executive Secretary of uh, SADC, um, Dr. Stekomena Lorentex, who would have liked to be part of this um, very exciting meeting, but due to other commitments and priorities, she was unable. I uh, am also uh, happy to be with you. Um, my role, as uh, JK has already said, is to basically give you the, the background of the resolution and also maybe a time allowing, I'll touch on the framework that we are using for preventing this new uh, new infections among adolescent girls and young women, and uh, also at the end, uh, you know, make a clarion call to member states to program uh, d'action. Ladies and gentlemen, the SADC region. Senhor e senhores, a região da SADC é uma das maiores, maiores número de, de contaminações para HIV SIDA e no tempo dessa resolução a ideia era criar um, um interesse por porque... And in March 2016 in the 60th uh, CSW session SADAC tabled the resolution a 62 led by the then Minister of Gender in Botswana because Botswana was then the, the chair of uh, SADC, uh, Mr. Um, Edwin Jenner Miso Batsu, urging the world to focus on the continued devastating effects of HIV and AIDS on women and girls. This was also meant to raise political commitment to address the root causes to the high levels of new infections among young women and adolescents as I was saying, girls and the burden of AIDS on women. The idea was also to call on countries to take action across multiple sectors to effectively address the social and structural drivers of HIV among women and girls. So in June, 2016, meeting of the SADC ministers responsible for gender and women's affairs, the Senate Secretariat was then directed to facilitate the development of a regional program to implement the resolution. Process of uh, developing framework and program of action entailed a multi-sectoral constitutive process leveraging on uh, existing work by member states and linking to other global and regional frameworks to demonstrate SADC's resolve to implement UN treaties, as well as the adopted resolution, SADC developed a framework and program of action on this UN resolution uh, 60 stroke two. I must also mention that uh, since 1999, it's always very, very difficult to get a consensus on this resolution. But uh, in 2016 in New York, uh, for the first time, there was a consensus on this resolution. So it was a big leap. The framework seeks to highlight priority actions and interventions based on the CSW resolution 60 through two and indicators for progress in harmony with the targets as set in the UNH fast track that um, honor alluded to, the first lady of Botswana. To end AIDS targets for 2020, as well as the high level political declaration and the SADC protocol on monitoring and evaluation framework. 
the framework is intended to, uh, for use by all those who have a role in working with the Southern African Development Community member states in dealing with major challenges that are barriers to the empowering of women and girls in the context of HIV and AIDS. The objective of the program of action is to catalyze and accelerate implementation of the resolution at the national and regional level within SADC member states. The purpose of this framework and program of action is to put spotlight on adolescents, young women and girls, to encourage common focus and mutual accountability in tackling the region and high rates of HIV infections amongst adolescents, young women and girls, to encourage multi-stakeholder and multi-sector approach, to encourage greater investment in a core package of interventions that will help the region bring down new infections to below 100,000 by the year 2020, which we are now in 2021 is for us to now reflect as whether really this was achieved, to increase understanding of what works in addressing structural drivers of HIV among adolescent, young girls and uh, women, and to also look at um, the implementation tool that uh, was developed for this resolution. This resolution has five key strategies or strategic areas in the program of action. The first one is to promote equal, equal economic opportunities for women and girls, full engagement of men and boys, promoting access to retention and completion of education by girls, scaling up scientifically accurate age appropriate comprehensive sexuality education, including sexual reproductive health and reproductive rights, enacting and intensifying the implementation of laws, policies and strategies to eliminate gender-based violence. And I must add here that uh, if you are to look at uh, the demographic dividend report that was um, developed after this resolution in African Union Commission, you will see that uh, even though the, the wedding is different, what they have there trying to alleviate the problems of young people, even though it is not specific to HIV like this one, uh, it resonates very well with what we have here. As a result of these, the tool that was developed um, we came up with what we call a gender responsive oversight model, popularly known as GROM. This was to be a monitoring UN, uh, this was to be used for monitoring this uh, uh, UN resolution. And- um, One minute, one minute, Dr. Fitzo. Okay. So go ahead, you have one minute left. Oh, I have one minute. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's what I was saying, not even cognizant. Yeah, no, um, as a way of um, implementing this um, um, resolution, um, SADC Secretariat working with the SADC Parliamentary Forum uh, came up with uh, uh, what we call gender responsive oversight model. This was an instrument designed to monitor the implementation of SADC sponsored uh, resolution, as well as ensuring the reason why it has oversight that uh, members of parliament, especially regional women caucus, ensure that they make the executive to account in, in implementing this uh, resolution. The idea was that um, members of parliament would um, urge the executive of their member states to take this resolution on board. And of course, there was a report that um, uh, 
uh, you know, um, there was a research that was carried out in 2019. We have the report. I thought I would, uh, you know, um, share some of the, 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 the findings. Uh, where now it was um, documented what other countries are doing. But what I need to hasten to say before I stop, um, ladies and gentlemen, is that this resolution, usually when we, every two years, when we go to the UN General Assembly, we always have to state whether it should be revised or not. And we have maintained that um, since the implementation of the tenets of this resolution is very slow, we should maintain it as it is, because the idea also is that we have realized that whenever there's a, a revision of resolutions, we always go back at the UN rather than going forward. I'm sorry to say this, because the language that is always put is always retrogressive rather than in progressive. So we maintain this resolution and I think we will, by 2022, uh, we should also decide whether we still maintain it. But uh, so far, member states have uh, uh, resolved that uh, we should maintain it. And all what I can do at this juncture in conclusion is to say, please familiarize yourself with this framework of action and the, and the program of action to actually look at the targets because they are aligned to the international norms so that uh, we can catalyze and accelerate implementation. With those uh, few uh, ways, let me stop here so that I allow okay. others to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pizzo. And it's always so good to have that background. Um, we are running a bit uh, behind time, so I will not be giving the extensive bios of the speakers and uh, I will instead post them and put them together with a, a recording of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the session. And uh, I'm going to call on uh, next, as Joe mentioned, that one of the pillar in the resolution is the promotion of equal economic opportunities uh, for women and access to decent work. And for that, we're going to hear from a representative of Her Excellency, Dr. Veronique um, Tognifode. And um, because of um, electoral uh, requirements, she was uh, called in a, an emergency meeting. And she's represented today by Madame Baboni uh, 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 Memuna. And she is the current Administrateur des Services Financiers, Directrice Générale des Affaires Sociales du Ministère des Affaires Sociales de la Microfinance uh, du Bénin. Madame uh, uh, Baboni, uh, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady from Botswana, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, be part of this panel on this topic uh, to promote uh, the equality of economic opportunities and uh, decent work for uh, women and girls. And uh, it's an African vision, of course. So at this uh, parallel uh, event, uh, I would like to focus on the topic of the, um, on the implementation of resolution uh, 62 um, on relating to uh, women, uh, girls and HIV AIDS more than ever. We need to focus on the inequalities of the genders to end, to put an end to AIDS. As um, in the uh, in my role as a specialist, I uh, met a minister uh, from Benin, who is the chairperson of the uh, technical committee on uh, the equ uh, gender equality, equality between men and women, and uh, emancipation of women. I would like or empowerment of women. I would like our um, 
attendees to measure the importance of the promotion of equality, of uh, equal economic opportunities and decent work for women and girls in African countries who are very uh, much um, in search of uh, um, uh, solutions faced with the current uh, uh, socio-economic uh, sida. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs, la crise que nous traversons actuellement. Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, perhaps the um, uh, the opportunity now has arrived where we need to uh, focus on the reliability and the efficiency of the mechanisms and the uh, uh, approaches that are developed developed internationally, regionally, and uh, locally in, with regard to promote the uh, equality and equity of gender in the sharing of roles and responsibilities in our uh, different uh, societies. So what are the uh, public powers doing concretely? to guarantee equal access to economic uh, opportunities and all social categories and also uh, to the most vulnerable uh, among whom are um, the disabled women and girls the the approaches that have been developed up to now were they really able to enhance the resilience of the most vulnerable um, in the face of the current crisis it is an invitation for us to make sure that these mechanisms and these approaches can really efficiently can efficiently bring a, a social justice in the uh, power uh, relations so that there is access for women and girls uh, to uh, economic opportunities and in the control of resources within their own communities. Uh, social justice and equity and equality between the genders is an it's a fundamental principle to be able to guarantee the reliability and the efficiency of the uh, approaches and solutions that are developed to do, uh, to respond to the hiv uh, aids pandemic and the COVID uh, pandemic to date it is generally denounced that poverty is and HIV and AIDS are feminized uh, conditions, especially in the underdeveloped countries. It is therefore very urgent for us that we need to work in Africa to correct this uh, critical situation and to give back hope to the women, to the girls of the continent by freeing their initiatives and their creativity on a socio-economic level to make them more resilient with, um, when they face these uh, pandemics. The vision, the African vision that is shared by all of the stakeholders is to free the uh, creative initiatives of girls and women on the continent in all areas and that it's it's about promoting equality of opportunities economic opportunities but and also to promote decent work for these girls and women and this vision is is uh, and is part of the African Union and uh, is also part of the Maputo Protocol and is uh, translated into a commitment, a political commitment by the heads of state and government um, and is also um, in Agenda 2063. The the solemn declaration, declaration on the equality or gender equality is based on different pillars and it's based on the 10 year uh, pillar to promote equality between men and women. And this vi African vision is explicitly defined in the strategy of the African Union to on gender equality and also for the empowerment of women for from 2018 to 2028. And in this regard, I would like to um, invite all of us to think and to act together in a manner that is innovative and efficient with regard to the op operationalization of this strategy. Let's have faith in our values. Uh, 
and our capacities to uh, face the common challenges with regard to equality and also in women empowerment and the empowerment of girls in this con uh, international crisis of the uh, health crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Baboni. Indeed, you could not have said it um, any stronger that to end AIDS, we need economic uh, empowerment for women. We need access to social and economic justice. We, and we have what it takes to be innovative enough and ensure that happens. And um, because we don't have time, I forgot to mention to the participants that maybe if you have a question, kindly post them under the Q&A uh, section on your, on your, on your um, uh, Zoom um, 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 uh, link. And then we'll see what we can address now. And if we can't, we'll add the responses to the questions to the summary of the, of, of the recordings, which we'll be able to share with you at a later stage. So without uh, further do I um, want to invite uh, to the floor Dr. Remy Shawa, a project officer, education for health and well-being of UNESCO, to talk to us about the uh, comprehensive uh, sexuality education. As you know, it's one of the pillars of the resolution. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Shawa is um, uh, uh, providing support to 21 countries in East and Southern Africa on the implementation of the comprehensive sexuality education. And uh, uh, Dr. Shawa, if I may, um, we know that comprehensive sexuality education is a great strategy in, to ensure prevention of HIV and GBV. But uh, 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 lately we've been seeing resistance. Could you tell us why you think that is and what we should do or could do in order to uh, uh, ensure this strategy is taken uh, on and uh, taken, uh, taken on by uh, member states? Over to you. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady, uh, Honorable Ministers, esteemed colleagues. My point of departure when talking about comprehensive sexuality education really is a shared understanding of what we are talking about, because much of the opposition to CSC stems from the misunderstanding of what CSC is and what is included in the CSC package. So for the purposes of this session, please let us use the globally accepted definition that CSC is a curriculum best process of teaching and learning about the cognitive, the emotional, the physical and the social aspects of sexuality. Good quality CSC is age appropriate, it's culturally appropriate, and it promotes respect and positive values among the learners. The gains to be made from CSC are important for all learners, but particularly promising for girls who carry a disproportionate burden of poor sexual health outcomes. Girls in Sub-Saharan Africa are two to seven times more likely to be infected with HIV than their male counterparts. And we know that at least 10 million unintended pregnancies occur each year between uh, 15 and 19 year olds. So if we know that CSC helps to challenge all these problems, why do we still have uh, opposition? Let me just mention that what we know is that this opposition is not indigenous to Africa, in that it did not originate from parents and communities where CSC is being implemented. And we know this because parents and communities have been part and parcel of the contextualization of CSC into the local context at country level. We also know that opposition, mostly supported by right-wing organizations from the West, target parents and raise misinformation and fear in order to take us backwards. We also know that in times that we have met with parents and communities and unpacked CSC, we have seen an increase in the support, whether it's among traditional leaders or religious leaders. So that is key. So with this opposition going on, how then do we move forward and accelerate CSC provision so that we scale up to every young person? First of all, I feel like I mentioned at the beginning that 
We need to demystify CSE, to unpack it. We need to be very transparent and open to the public to be able to show what is content within the CSE curriculum. Learning from South Africa through the Department of Basic Education, they managed to do that. So they got the content, which is uh, the scripted lesson plans, and put it out into the public domain so that parents and communities could be able to interrogate and see exactly what the learners were learning in the classroom. And I think that is something we can learn in other countries. We must work with parents and communities as well as guardians. Because some of the concerns that we have gotten from parents are that, look, you are teaching children about CSC and SRHR, but we, the parents, are left in the dark. So how am I expected to continue this conversation in the home if I don't have the accurate information? So we need programs that target parents to empower them to be able to interrogate these issues around comprehensive sexuality education and also equip them with the skills to have conversations with their children. UNESCO through the Our Talks program tries to strengthen parent-child communication and also creates a platform where we bring parents and children together to start the conversation about their sexuality and their health. We need to train more teachers. Teachers should not just be tools of passing on information to learners. Teachers themselves have issues that they would require to be addressed. So we must ensure that the CSC that is targeted at teachers empowers them themselves, first of all, to take care of their own health and their well-being and then gives them the two resources that they need to be able to transfer that knowledge to the learner. When we do that, teachers feel more confident and they're able to deliver CSE. UNESCO and UNFP are working with governments in scaling up the provision of the online teacher training course on CSE, and we have seen remarkable progress. We need to engage more with civil society. Most of the CSC that happens out of school is actually led by non-governmental partners. They are critical to addressing the opposition to CSC and also to ensuring that the quality that is given to out of school youth is actually the same as the quality of CSC that in school youth receive. We need to accelerate political action. The landmark ESA ministerial commitment on CSC and youth-friendly services put CSC in the spotlight, and it continues to be a, a platform for advancing adolescent sexual reproductive health and rights. So we need to extend the mandate of the ESA commitment until 2030 to al align it with SDGs and also the SADC SIHR strategy. The new Education Plus initiative also takes CSC and other issues even further, and it positions CSC as a tool to advance girls' access to secondary school education because learning never stops. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us something. It has been a strong reminder that schools are more than just places for learning. They provide critical contributions towards children's health and well-being, including through access to CSE. When CSE is done well, it equips girls with knowledge and skills and values to make responsible choices about their sexual and social relationships in this world that is affected by HIV and GBV. So in ending, my clarion call as a parent myself of three kids is to ensure that parents are brought to the table even more and that we demystify CSE so that we can create from the ground up the much needed support for young people to be able to have access to this life-saving knowledge. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shawa. And I think you're very right. There is no better way of ensuring ownership than ensuring participation at the table of discussion and decision uh, making. So without taking um, any more time, I am want to move to our next speaker. Our next speaker, uh, is uh, representing um, um, uh, Frontline, 
but is not Dr. Uh, uh, Lewis, as previously mentioned, uh, Chigandu, but rather Ms. Tumi uh, Komanyani. And she is going to speak to us about the a, a, a perspective of the global HIV response and emerging opportunities for women and girls. And uh, um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Komanyani is um, indeed um, a, an accomplished development practitioner, and she's worked for over 25 years and uh, devoted to social and gender justice work. And uh, she also is a program lead uh, within Frontline uh, uh, AIDS, and she is a member of the EU UN uh, Spotlight Initiative on the uh, Civil Society Global Reference Group. And she holds and has received many accolades um, 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 spanning on her career because of uh, the inputs that she has done both in Botswana and out of Botswana. So um, uh, uh, to me, we have seen a lot of effort, both from global uh, to national to community, and uh, you have um, you are privileged to see work coming from global policy settings to national set policy settings and the program um, uh, uh, implementation. What, in your view, is the missing link? What are the gaps, and why is it that we are not seeing the results that equal the efforts that we put in the response? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. We can. Thank you. you. Um, Your Excellency, the First Lady of the Republic of Botswana, um, your Honorable Ministers, members of the Diplomatic Corps, my fellow panelists, as well as our esteemed participants who have joined the panel, um, good morning. Um, I, I, I come in as a young person, well, not so young anymore. Um, but one of the things that I always um, like to preface my contribution with is I'm part of a generation of people who at the height of the HIV epidemic um, was seen or was probably there was a lot of worry that many of us would not make it. And so I come with the experience of having been perhaps a guinea pig of many of the programs that were implemented in the early 90s, trying to get young people on board um, in the response to HIV. And so for us, this resolution sits directly in the programs that we manage, in the programs that we implement, as well in ways that we make sure that we respond in a very youth-centered way. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I work for Frontline AIDS, and Frontline AIDS is a world, is one of the world's largest partnerships of civil society organizations that work to create a future free, from, uh, free of AIDS for everyone. We work in over 100 countries and partner with over 180 um, NGOs and CBOs um, across the globe. And so my call um, for action joining this conversation is that if we are serious about becoming generation equality, we need to move beyond the rhetoric. Um, the global commitments and the blueprints that have been developed are well and good but they need to be followed by radical and transformative action across the different levels, be it at country level, in the communities, or even within our families. So we need to take lessons that we've learned from the HIV epidemic and the response that has actually seen so many more women and girls attain improved health outcomes, despite the various burdens they continue to face on a daily basis. Um, to do this, it is critical that we invest in a robust and accountable, independent women's civil society. We need to build strong, inclusive feminist movements. We need to transform the political and decision-making spaces that will ensure that we create agency and amplify voices of women and girls in very meaningful ways so that we ensure that the response to AIDS leaves no one behind. Our faces, especially as women and girls in the global south, remain the poster of the burden of HIV and AIDS, and we need to change this. We must support a new generation of young women leaders and activists who can demand greater accountability on sexual and reproductive health. And as my fellow colleague who just spoke before me, Dr. Remy Shawa mentioned, we also need to break the taboo around comprehensive sexuality education and clarify what that means and to stop allowing 
for the leftist movements to take over what is an agenda that requires all of us to support. Um, and when I talk about involving young people, I'm not talking about the tokenistic involvement, but I'm also calling to development partners to ensure that funding mechanisms respond to the different calls. So for example, at Frontline AIDS, just last year alone, we supported over 1.2 million women and 32,622 transgender people to access sexual reproductive health and rights services. We connected more than 1.4 million young people aged 10 to 24 to comprehensive sexuality education or life skills-based HIV education. We reached over 680,000 adolescent girls and young women with HIV prevention programs, and we enabled um, at least 250,000 of them to take an HIV test and receive their results. And this is important because it shows that once we have good policies and, uh, and, and legal framework in place, we need to be able to implement uh, programs that are funded and translate to impact on the ground. I work at Frontline AIDS as the programs lead for an amazing portfolio that is responsible for young people in the region. Mine is a mandate directly in line with the Resolution 60 Stroke 2. One of the programs that I work around uh, or read, work on is the Ready Portfolio of Programs, which is designed to build resilient and empowered adolescents and young people. We call ourselves Ready. So every time you hear me saying Ready, you know that this is the portfolio that I'm talking about. We know that this work is vital because HIV is the second largest cause of death of adolescents globally and the first in Africa. Young people all over the world can join the READY movement to demand their right to a healthy life, whatever the circumstances, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. A program that is also close to my heart is READY Plus. Um, it is one of the programs that we implement that focuses on work with young people living with HIV. In the current phase of READY Plus, we aimed to reach 30,000 young people who are living with HIV in Eswatini, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. This is a four-year program funded by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Maputo. And up to date, we have successfully increased access to holistic care and support. We have, not pro we have promoted not only sexual reproductive health and rights, but also mental health in order to foster resilience. We work through the community adolescent treatment supporters, we are famously known as the CATS, who play a vital role and ensure that they also um, enable the spread of services and access to commodities to the home through clinical visits and home-based care and support. Ours is an evidence-based model that is ready for scaling up. And I hope that member states here present will invest in programs such as Ready Plus as a best practice model for engaging young people living with HIV. And before I close off, I wanted to share what other programs are in place in the region that are really worth noting given the impact that we have seen so far. One of the uh, tools that we have developed is called the Rights Evidence and Action. It's the REACT tool. This tool uh, was designed to record human rights violations that happen when accessing HIV and health services. And I want to pause here for a moment because we often think that going to the clinic, getting services or treatment is as easy as breathing, but many and thousands of people continue to face uh, barriers when it comes to access to services. Community-based organizations in about 22 countries where REACT is being implemented and many of them include in our region, in Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, are now in the process of improving this documentation system to more specifically document gender-based violence-related human rights barriers and enhance social uh, organizational capacity. We also just finished uh, implementing a program called the Partnership to Inspire, Transform, and Connect the HIV, known as PITCH. This was a five-year response that ended in 2020 in nine countries. Um, and in Southern Africa, we worked with other partners such as ARASA and the, South, and the SRHR Africa Trust um, in four Southern African countries and trained over 100 young champions 
to advocate for the integration of SRHR and HIV. Your Excellency, Honorable Ministers and esteemed panelists, what is clear is that we need to strengthen our approaches to avoid the ongoing fragmentation in our response. It is required of us that gender equality needs to move beyond the rhetoric to measurable practice. The time is now that we work collectively and support the different investments by donors to fully implement this resolution, as well as other development goals and aspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to me for um, uh, giving us a bit of a background and a bit of the experience of programs that can actually work and be scalable in order to make a difference. And uh, so for that, uh, I will link us directly to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Rukia Maniko, in order to, to give us a, a bit of a global and regional overview of what is needed indeed in order for us to invest in women's empowerment. We've heard from, um, from uh, the, the uh, uh, previous speakers that if we are to make a difference, we really need to consider changing how we do and work with women. And uh, uh, Rukia, can you give us what you think are challenges and opportunities in investing in women in order to make a difference and end AIDS? Over to you. Rukia uh, is um, a, 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 an experienced international professional and business development player for over 16 years. She's working, currently working with a global fund and uh, to fight uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and is based in Geneva. She has covered a range of regions, including uh, currently covering Africa and the Middle East. And she has worked for many years in the gender equality uh, world and uh, has also been uh, coordinating the work on adolescent girls and young women uh, across all the Global Fund Secretariat. And that is just a few of the many accomplishments of Rukia, and we'll post the whole bio on, in the summary. Over to you, Rukia. Uh, good morning, uh, Your Excellency, uh, First Lady, uh, Honorable Ministers, uh, fellow panelists, and uh, all participants, all protocols observed. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for that uh, generous introduction, and, and thank you to all the organizers uh, of this event. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll tackle your question, Jackie, from uh, the macro level. Uh, I see various gaps, but I'll mention just one that uh, stands out for me. I know we've talked uh, a lot about the programmatic responses, but what I see uh, now more than ever, we need to sort out the fragmentation issue. Uh, fragmentation of, of SRH and uh, HIV response is again linked to the empowerment uh, of, of women and girls or development programs. So a question for us, um, how are we investing together? and how are we working together towards addressing the needs uh, of women and girls? So in many instances, um, we still work uh, or fund and do advocacy uh, in silos. Uh, this is also a, a criticism uh, to, to, to the work that, that I also do and, and, and many of you. Uh, so you'll hear of the HIV sector, you'll, you'll hear of the SRH sector, uh, the GBV sector, the education sector, economic empowerment sector, I don't even know which ones uh, I'm forgetting. There are so many, as you know, uh, but unfortunately uh, they work in silos. Uh, they also have uh, separate uh, strategies. Uh, we also know that we fund them uh, as funders separately uh, through the line ministries, uh, through the different uh, programs. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, we are all targeting the same woman, uh, the same girl, yet, we, we've, we've decided to, to divide uh, this uh, woman or, or girl's life. And sometimes we've even decided to divide uh, the body of this woman. And, uh, and I think for me, uh, this son stands out uh, as the biggest challenge. Uh, we, we keep saying we need to put uh, women and girls at the center. But then for me, what this means is uh, targeting uh, the woman or the girl based on their needs, uh, based on their unique experiences, then bringing these programs and this funding and these uh, approaches uh, uh, to the center uh, of where uh, this woman is at uh, at that point in time. So for me, this fragmentation is a big issue. 
Um, and, and I'm happy uh, to, to hear today, uh, we are talking of, of the SADC strategy, and, and I know UN Women is also leading together with other UN partners in, in coordinating the response and together with the different ministries. But then I think we need to, 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 to sort of take a step back and ask ourselves the critical questions on what we are actually doing by having these very many, many programs, very many funds, uh, short-term programs, uh, everyone is, of course, trying to, to reach uh, the woman and to reach the girl. Everyone is trying their best. But then I think uh, it would make more sense and would be more impactful if we actually came uh, together as partners, as funders. So I think just one recommendation uh, in the interest of time, and I won't go into nitty gritty details. Uh, one recommendation uh, that I see based on this challenge of fragmentation is for all of, all of us to support and strengthen. Uh, multisectoral coordination that is anchored against one national uh, multisectoral strategy. Uh, of course, different ministries have different mandates, different uh, UN agencies, different funders are focusing on different issues, but are we working together towards one common joined up multisectoral strategies, or will we keep having different strategies for different sectors and having different technical working groups? So I know that might be uh, a bit uh, sounding harsh, but then I think we need to rethink how we are investing in women and girls. We need to all come together. We need to stop this fragmentation and we need to be very clear on what national goal or targets, even at the subnational level, are we jointly working towards? And we need to stop this, uh, this way we approach things from our different worlds and our different boxes. So I'll just stop there, uh, Jackie. And, and uh, you asked me, I know earlier to be, to be frank and critical, so I know there's, there's funding all over, there's all these things you're trying to do, but we are still asking ourselves, why is the data still looking the way it is? So I'll just put it out there and I'm hoping as we go forward, we can be talking towards how we are all coming together for a common good, targeting the woman or the girl in need. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Rukia. Exactly uh, uh, straight on what we really needed to hear. And it's so funny because I think this epidemic has been with us for way too long. Because I remember, for some of us who are not that young anymore, in the early days of the response, we actually had a, a multisexual approach and mainstreaming approach. And I think we lost that in the process. And uh, I think um, that's one of the things that Sadak actually uh, tried to do within the context of this uh, resolution. Whenever I know that whenever we are invited uh, to support their initiatives in their meetings, they have decided not to meet just at gender ministries or not to meet just as, uh, as a, a National AIDS Council, but rather to be together in order to have that coordinated indeed initiative in, in responding. But I agree with you, this is something that we need to flag and be able to actually see how we take it uh, forward. We said this is a beginning of a critical conversation and the participants and the, and the collaborators will continue the conversation. Um, so thank you so much. And I will now call on Catherine Nyambura because we've spoken about the women, we've spoken about the need for participation, but we know that at least in the East and Southern Africa region, the young woman is really at the core of um, a, a strategy for response, should be at the core for strategy for response, is the one who is still really under um, a, a duress of the epidemics, the pre epidemics, like our executive director, uh, Madame Pumzile Mlambonika calls it, uh, 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 GBV and HIV. And uh, I want to know from you, um, uh, Catherine, you have advocated for the voice of uh, young women. What will it take to have a truly an effective participation of young women? So Catherine Nyambura is, is a, an international development expert who is a Pan-African pa feminist. For those of us who have known her, she has forever been a strong voice for young women. And uh, she did uh, her studies in biomedical and research and public policy, but is uh, the director of program at Athena and enjoys uh, working with uh, feminist networks, adolescent girls and young women and grassroots movement. And without taking too much time, over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady, Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, and all protocols observed. 
Jackie, the answer to your question should be a simple yes or no, whether adolescent girls and young women are participating or mean, being meaningfully engaged. But I think it would be great for us to start by reflecting on what the challenges are and what the gaps are. And um, it would be amiss not to reflect on some of the profound um, and exacerbated challenges adolescent girls are, are currently experiencing due to COVID-19. And so I want to situate my response to you, both in the context of the resolution and HIV, AIDS and GBV, but very much for grounding that experience within the current realities of living our lives at, as adolescent girls and young women in the era of a pandemic. So the pandemic has brought with it unprecedented challenges and particularly for meaningful engagement of girls and young women. We have seen with, with COVID-19 how a public health emergency has posed to has continued to impact and unfold in multiple intersecting ways in our communities. It has reinforced inequalities across race, across gender and across countries. So adolescent girls continue to report an increase in GBV in their lives by the impact of COVID-19, the restrictions of movement, the financial hardships, where we have seen an uh, increase in heightened um, online violence, exploitation, and various forms of gender-based violence. We have seen that the travel and movement restrictions, they pose a, a challenge in terms of providing um, response and prevention services for GBV. And we have seen how um, the hardship itself has resulted in economic violence and economically instigated violence because majorly adolescent girls and young women and particularly young women in the informal sector operate in cash economies. And uh, in addition as well to gender-based violence, COVID-19 has exacerbated drivers of HIV acquisition amongst adolescent girls and young women, causing more strain, particularly for those living positively. We have seen an increase in, um, in, in HIV-related stigma, and, and which has been worsened by COVID-19. The global the disruption and, and collapse of global supply chains has made it difficult to access SRHR services, prevention and, and, and treatment and care. WHO, from WHO and UNAIDS modeling, there is projection of significant reversal in gains, in gains made uh, to prevent vertical transmission. So even when at the table, even when girls were at the table, now more than uh, ever, it's much more difficult for them to engage meaningfully. And even where physical uh, travel was feasible, it's much now, now it's much more difficult. And due to the gender-based violence, gender digital divide, disproportionate burdens of unpaid care work, and dwindled uh, funding to institutions and, and platforms that facilitate and support their meaningful engagement, it is much more difficult to ensure girls and young women are on the table. So our world has evolved and COVID-19 tells a tale of how quickly a global health emergency can put, can put the precarious gains, particularly on HIV prevention at risk. Overnight, we might as well go back five years back and even more if we continue at this pace. But we have opportunities that we can be uh, th thinking and reflecting on, on how to foreground and, and recenter adolescent girls and young women who are at the epicenter of the epidemic, particularly in our region. So for us as Athena, we see we have a few opportunities we wanted the, the, the people and members today to consider. Number one is we welcome the global aid strategy, which was uh, adopted yesterday at the PCB. We see this as a blueprint for ensuring that we have an intersectional approach to ending AIDS by addressing the multiple intersecting inequalities and ensuring that we are prioritized ending gender inequality. We see the strategy as an opportunity for governments and stakeholders across the world to recommit funding and political will to the HIV response in a gender transformative manner, including allocating resources at the national level, followed by a robust engagement of civil society, and especially women's rights organization and young women-led networks to track, monitor and, track, track and monitor progress. Secondly, is the upcoming high-level meeting on AIDS. We, this will be an opportunity for SADC member states, along with other member states across the world, to safeguard the gains on gender equality in the 2016 political declaration and recommit with high level political will to ensure a gender responsive human rights and a continued commitment to young women's leadership in the global HIV response. We are nine years away from 2030, and, but we are still far from reaching the global targets. Why? Because we have let our commitment and guard down. Now is not the time, but it is a time for us to accelerate commitment and momentum and ensure that we leverage the opportunities of the high level meeting, the global aid strategy to accelerate um, our commitment to end aid by 2030. 
Our last, our last opportunity is the Gender Equality Forum. It provides a platform to reflect on progress and advancing gender equality in the last 26 years. One of the most glaring gaps is sustainable resourcing for gender equality and women and girls empowerment. Across most of our countries, gender ministries tend to be the most under-resourced of ministries. And according to evidence, only 1% of gender funding from the glo from, uh, of global gender funding gets to women's rights networks, particularly in the global south, and even less gets to young women-led and young feminist networks. So we need to take advantage of the gender equality opportunity to commit sustainable and quality funding and resourcing for adolescent girls and young women-led intervention that promotes agency, autonomy, and well-being of adolescent girls and young women in all our diversity. As I close, I want to urge all of us to foreground engagement of adolescent girls and young women in localized responses that are set and grounded in global policies and standards, such as the 60 2 resolution. We want to ensure that we all meaningfully and nurture uh, and amplify the leadership of adolescent girls and young women and ensure that the HIV response is cutting across the continuum of national, regional, and global. I thank you. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Catherine, for giving us those crystal clear um, um, a pointers to what we need to do in order to ensure a, a full, effective, and meaningful participation of young women. And I th and thank you also for reminding us that we have um, uh, we have um, um, a, a great opportunity, such as the new uh, strategy, a UNAID strategy, which indeed highlights uh, a, a, a huge lenses on inequalities and also the opportunity for the high level meeting, which I believe you'll be um, uh, participating and engaging actually uh, uh, consultations in order to inform that meeting. And indeed, this is the time is now and we can, if we really work together, uh, 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 deliver significantly on the uh, uh, response of HIV and gender inequality. I am, we have run out of time, but we are uh, requesting your humble, um, um, uh, uh, we are humbly requesting your patience as we extend by just 10 to 15 minutes in order to uh, finalize. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm biased, but to me, the discussions are engaging and I, do, I hope we are, you are not bored and you'll be able to just be with us for 15 minutes. And without further ado, I'll call on Koteka uh, Noguduka, our um, uh, uh, fellow colleague from the uh, South Africa National AIDS uh, 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 Council, who is the executive manager of National Strategic uh, Plan Implementation, to give us an overview of, of the, the experience as an, as an, a, at the national response level of the triple e epidemic of COVID-19, GBV, and HIV AIDS. And uh, Koteka, um, your view of how uh, COVID be presented a challenge or an opportunity to actually see things differently in order to ensure that the response is resilient even to further crises. Um, uh, Ms. Nogoduka is, um, um, has been um, um, in the, uh, serving in the SANAC uh, Trust and her role includes planning, coordination, and overseeing the technical dimensions of the National Strategic Plan. She is at the heart of the thinking uh, and uh, uh, in order to ensure the response is really uh, coherent with the uh, uh, context. And she is a public health specialist and uh, has had um, 18 year, over 18 years of experience within this field. Uh, and over to you, Madam C. Thank you very much, Sister Jackie, for that warm uh, to our First Lady of Botswana. Uh, the honorable ministers, uh, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon to you from South Africa. Uh, Sister Jackie, based on the time, I'm not going to go um, to the long uh, conversation that I wanted to have. Uh, other speakers have also touched to some of the key fundamental issues that we have been trying to address around HIV response as well as GBV response uh, that uh, severely impact on women, one of the speakers uh, really touched on the core 
of the feminization of HIV and GPV and the challenges that we are facing uh, in trying to respond to these epidemics. So we saw the year 2020 as a year um, that we were marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action uh, that was intended to be groundbreaking for gender equality. But instead we saw the COVID-19 uh, coming into play, the pandemic uh, taking us uh, back and limiting our, our gains that we've, we've made in the past decades. And, and, and we were standing at the risk of rolling back in terms of the gains that we've made in responding to women issues. We've seen the COVID-19 in South Africa where women suffered severe economic and social impact from the lockdown that was imposed to keep the spread of, of, of the virus. And also the challenge that we were sitting with at the South African National AIDS Council in our capacity as being responsible for coordinating HIV, TB, and STI's response in the country uh, and looking at human rights as well as GBV impact uh, in, in, in responding to HIV. We were seeing a pattern where the, the dual epidemics of HIV and GBV were likely to increase as security, health, and money worries were heightened uh, amongst women. Uh, the cramped and confined living during the pandemic was increasing uh, and the outbreaks now we're colliding. So we had a, a, a system that uh, HIV, GPV, and COVID-19 were colliding as epidemics that were, were impacting heavily on women uh, in South Africa. So just going quickly to the lessons learned that we think we can be able to adapt uh, from COVID-19, looking at, at the time constraints that we the first lesson that I thought uh, we, we, we can learn from the COVID-19 response was the power of prioritization. We saw everybody pulling resources together, prioritizing one epidemic, and uh, we see how then everything else followed in addressing uh, COVID-19, where public health, research, uh, economy, everybody was also aligning in the matching lines because we saw that the power of politics and leadership in responding and prioritizing to COVID-19 gave that framework and that uh, environment uh, for responding. So for us, we want to learn how can we then learn uh, how to prioritize to drive us uh, during this last mile that we have in, 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 in going towards ending HIV and GPV while we are still addressing the HIV epidemic. Um, I know in literature, there's quite a number of a, a, a literature that is out there that is talking about the dangers of complacency while we're responding to, to women's rights and women issues, talking about the fact that we do not have time for complacency for us to be able to end GPV, HIV, as well as, 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 as COVID-19. So we want to make sure that as we take forward the response around HIV and, and GPV during COVID-19, we have the political commitment and the political leadership. We have the resources to be able to respond uh, as well as we have the capacity and the ability to ensure that community empowerment continues to take place. And specifically in this case, we're talking about the community as the community of women in all their diversity. The second lesson that we've learned uh, is the lesson to adapt. We've seen uh, globally how societies had to quickly adapt uh, to COVID-19 regulations and rules uh, in how to cap the COVID-19. Therefore, we want to make sure that um, as the HIV and GBV response, how do we maintain these responses in a world that has been shaped by COVID-19? How do we adapt uh, the responses and we evolve our responses to make sure that when, when, when another crisis come, when another epidemic and another outbreak come, finds us uh, good enough to rapidly change our environment in how do we provide services and how do we provide support for women to continue having women that are protected from HIV, uh, that their uh, uh, social standing in the communities is protected, as well as ensuring that women realities are taken into account as we provide the adaptation uh, around COVID-19 environment. The last lesson for me is the lesson of, uh, we've seen how solidarity, partnership and coordination has made an impact in, in, in addressing uh, uh, COVID-19. Therefore, we want to learn those lessons to say, how do we have unified responses? I think the two last speakers touch on this issue of how do we have a, a consolidated, coordinated, 
unified response when we deal with issues around women instead of having segregated uh, approaches to, to, to the response. How do we ensure that we strengthen the community engagement to enhance the community ownership? In this case, it's women we want to look at how do we ensure that we support women activism and women feminine activism to make sure that combined and unified approach of how women deal with their issues in the region, in the continent, we are able to pull ourselves together and be able to support. So, Sis Jackie, just in, 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 in closing, we want to make sure that we, we, we are ensuring that no women, no woman from birth to death experiences barriers to access the full range of HIV, GPV, and COVID-19 prevention and key and key services, as well as violation of their basic human rights. I think if we can be able to master uh, this agenda and we pull together all our resources, the whole of society can be able to benefit uh, from our efforts. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you, very much, Sister um, Madam C. And you have given us um, uh, the few uh, characteristics of how to be um, um, innovative institutions that can learn and, and, and be able to be resilient uh, um, uh, faced with, uh, with uh, a crisis. And thank you for that. And uh, colleagues, I think, and uh, we have really done uh, I hope well, uh, given the short uh, time that we had in order to exchange on this. And uh, I think a lot has been said, not all of it has been said. As we always mention, this is not intended to be a finality in, in itself as an event, but rather a start of a conversation. And we are hoping that the people around this table will then <clears throat> put together their heads and continue the conversation, which as you could tell, has really many critical facets to it. We invite also the participants, whenever you want to link with any or each one of us, please feel free to do so. And um, um, uh, for us to close the discussion for us, or rather to uh, give a bit of, um, of uh, a, a, a summary, um, of the discussions for us is the uh, um, uh, Honorable Minister, Dr. Patricia Ani Kaliati, the incoming chair of SADC uh, Malawi. And Honorable Dr. Patricia Kaliati is uh, a seasoned politician and former educator. She is the minister, the current minister of gender and community development and social uh, welfare. And she held, very, she held various ministerial positions in the past, and she has really been um, a, a very uh, known um, um, activist of uh, equality, gender equality. And she has a passion in helping vulnerable people, especially children, women, elderly, and people with disability. And she has so far managed to end early child marriages through engaging local chiefs in her community. She holds a PhD in development studies and a master's degree in counseling and guidance. So, uh, Honorable Your Excellency, uh, the floor is yours to give us a summary and what you think we should take from here and how you feel that as SADAC and as a global movement, we can advance this uh, uh, gender and HIV um, uh, response. Uh, thanks so much, my dear sister. Your Excellency, the First Lady of the Republic of, uh, the, the, of uh, Botswana, Madam uh, Masisi, uh, Honorable Minister uh, Modrani of uh, Saudi Chitarin, uh, of Wayne Chair, Mozambique, uh, Dr. Shawa, Project Officer, Education for Health and Wellbeing, uh, UNESCO, Mrs. Uh, Mariana Mohammed, Director of uh, Social Affairs, Madam Christine, uh, Director of uh, Frontline AIDS, uh, Dr. Joseph Fito, uh, head of gender unit of at SADI. Chokeka uh, uh, Noguba, executive director of uh, SANAP. A moderator, um, Annie, and UN, uh, the UN Women in Eastern and Southern Africa. The members of CISO, uh, civil society organizations. 
Honorable uh, Her Excellencies, uh, First Ladies of SADC, and all my seniors present uh, this afternoon, uh, a warm greetings from Malawi. It is an honor for me to, uh, to be afforded this opportunity to speak on comments and also closing remarks on the uh, incoming, as the incoming chair of uh, SADC on the progress in the implementation of uh, CSW, uh, Resolution 60-2, on women, the girl, child, and HIV. Uh, your, your Excellency, firstly, let me offer my appreciation to you, Chairperson, for the excellent, excellent leadership you have uh, uh, just demonstrated during the time you were a chair, uh, Chairperson. Uh, CSW Resolution 62 is a very important framework for implementation of uh, HIV AIDS interventions for women and girls in the region. Although there is uh, a decline in uh, attention towards HIV, it remains a serious problem uh, for the region. Adolescent girls and the young women continue to be victims of gender-based violence and the child marriage more than any other group in the region, which leads to HIV infection. Therefore, implementation of the CS CSW Resolution 2 is but a priority for the region. Malawi has come in and, uh, as a chairperson at, at the most difficult time in the history of Osadi when we are facing challenges to manage a very deadly COVID-19 pandemic. Due to COVID-19, we have not only lost many productive lives, but also witnessed the leveraging effects of the pandemic on our economies. Apart from negatively impacting people's life, the pandemic has also pushed many women out of the the economic, uh, the economic activities, as they are already smaller businesses have uh, corrupted. The COVID-19 new excesses has also brought about great misery to health and social services, which provide critical services to women and girls. Provision of HIV education and sexual and reproductive health services has severely been affected because of uh, cuts in the budgets and also the direction of uh, resources uh, to contain uh, the pandemic. Furthermore, across the region, various against women and girls have been very lumped and given challenging. Uh, that as uh, nations and the service members, we are really um, uh, uh, challenged to see that how best we are going to help our women and also girls and uh, the young women and boys as well. We don't leave even void behind as we think about the GBV, which is so lampant because the boys are the source of those challenges, if you really are not even thought of. Across the, the regions, yes, not only Malawi, but we know certain uh, regions, we are really affected with uh, COVID. Finding sol lasting solutions to address the, uh, scale, the scars left by the pandemic, especially on women and girls. Your exercises should be a priority uh, that we need to look into it. Therefore, as the incoming chair, uh, we work closely with members, member states in order to bring back uh, better and also working with uh, the outgoing chairperson, looking into the uh, guidelines, where to start and what we're supposed to be doing, that we need to coordinate as member states and also ministers. In this regard, we need to invest in women's economic empowerment activities and to make sure that children marriages and teen pregnancies are addressed by among other uh, things supporting young women and girls to go back to school as a matter of ages and principle. This cannot be done without the involvement of key stakeholders such as traditional and religious leaders, civil society organizations and various donor agencies among others at the national level. As Malawi and the Minister of Gender, we started already dissolving the marriages and even in uh, coordinating and readmission of our girls, especially during exams, that those girls who are pregnant, who are pregnant, they are able to go and sit for exams. You never know, tomorrow they might be selected special education. Those who went into marriages so young because of a number of areas, uh, apparent care, uh, poverty, uh, those we dissolved the marriages and both of those sent them to school. As of now, we've dissolved almost 10,000 marriages. And we are still doing it, knowing that it's a process. We are integrating them with a number of pro programs that they've got to be doing, especially those who 
didn't go into the curriculum of education to make sure that we give them still training, still training, those training in skills that they can even learn the living. Investing in the sexual and reproductive health rights is also another key priority. For us to manage the outcomes of the cells place at the peak of the pandemic for gender-based violence, HIV, have corrupted because of the pandemic. We will work closely with members to ensure that young women and girls have access to community education through strengthening reform and also coordination mechanisms, as well as mainstreaming of uh, women and girls uh, lived realities in all the interventions. We have, we salute the young, the young women in the generation equality, the feminist movement, uh, feminist, I mean, feminist, feminist movement, but also for equality. And this is what we're looking forward to deal with issues of DPP, issues of LMRH, issues of uh, HIV AIDS. We need to be working with uh, the young women. And they, the young women, they're able to understand what type of life they want to live. And we have a gender policy as Malawi, which we, have in, in the public as well as the private investors so that they can be following up what our national plan of action as the Minister of Gender. Further, we still make sure that we mobilize resources to facilitate implementation of the framework as well as other domesticated instruments within the region. Let me thank the Botswana First Lady, Your Excellency, Madam Masisi, and through you to all uh, Saturday First Ladies. And in a, in, in a special way to the Saturday Malawi uh, First Lady, Madam Monica Chikera. To you, our seniors, our First Lady, thank you very much for the job well done. You've been supporting us in each and every uh, program development processes uh, and also the gender mental programming. We are looking forward to see your uh, support uh, to, to continuously supporting the Minister of Gender and the members and, and also nations at large uh, that we need to move forward as we are looking into the improvements and also interventions of each issue to do with the APS. We depend on you that, that you are taking our messages to the leadership. And you are our, our mentors, and you are our champion in all Africa, in each and every government process. And we urge all women to take part in the each we salute you very much and take our messages to the heads of the states for the support which they provide to the ministers, different ministers at Sadiq level. With these remarks, I would like to call upon all member states and also federal ministers responsible for gender and women's affairs to join and support Malawi as we lead the legion in this noble cause. As I salute you, I do not even leave a stone attend as we salute our civil society organizations for coming in to implement government policies. And it is our wish and prayer that the coordination between the coordination uh, between the members, the Sadiq member states, the media, civil society organization, it should, throw, should grow stronger for the betterment of our people in the Sadiq regions. And we support them for the uh, programs of HIV, for the TPPs, and also the end of early marriages for the Malawian, for the women and the girl children. Thanks so much. May God remember you in a special way. I uh, thank so much. Thank you very, very much, Honorable Minister uh, Kaliati. And as always, a very impassioned um, um, uh, rendering of your commitments. And we really do appreciate uh, how SADAC is very committed both to the uh, fights for gender equality, but mostly also to ensuring that uh, girls and women are truly uh, are able to conquer the twin pandemic of uh, epidemics of uh, HIV and, uh, and gender inequality. And thank you so much uh, to our audience. You have been very patient with us. We've gone over time, but I believe this was a, a really needed conversation, which as I mentioned, is just a start of a dialogue. So let's go out there and continue the dialogue. And um, uh, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady of Botswana, Ms. Neogen Masisi, Your Excellencies, Honorable uh, Mondrani, and Your Excellency, Honorable Kaliati, 
and um, uh, the representative of uh, Her Excellency Dogmi Fode and uh, honorable members of parliament, my colleagues uh, in the international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, representatives, SADAC and other regional uh, um, organizations, representatives of the youth, civil society, my distinguished panel, it was a true, uh, a, a, a humble um, honor to really um, be the facilitator of this session, which is very close to my heart and I believe is a start of a conversation which can actually indeed lead us to ending um, HIV and gender inequality soon. I will be bidding you farewell, but before I do that, I was requested by our um, uh, support to get all the panelists to kindly switch on your, your, your video because they want to take a, a photo. Apparently they can do that. So ki kindly go ahead and open your, your, your video and let's uh, take the photo. And Lola, you'll guide us and tell us if this, if this is okay. It's working, I think we're good. Okay, so if everyone can just look into their cameras, that'd be great. And I'm gonna take a couple, so if you can bear with me. So I'm gonna do one and then I'm gonna do another. So on the count of three, one, two, three. And I'm going to do one more. On the count of three, one, two, three. Fantastic, thank you very much, everyone. You're most welcome. So participants, distinguished participants and uh, uh, distinguished panelists, thank you very much for a good session and uh, the conversation and Aluta Continua will be in touch and continue the conversations. And over to you, technical team. <laughs>